for the first two lectures, so I'm going to be relying a bit more on that. Uh, and then um, my own lecture notes and this nice um, snow mass report with uh, Anna and uh, Monica to try to give you a scope by the end of it of some of this, uh, this dictionary as it's built up today. So like what the state of the art uh, was as of uh, 2021 and then I'll fill it in from there. So the goal of uh, the different lectures is going to be today we just want to see the bigger picture and a little bit of the setup for this IR triangle. And nicely, we've already heard a little bit about geodesic congruences, and so we can ask questions about um, what observers very far away are going to see. There's going to be these memory effects. And so that's where we'll end today. And then tomorrow, the goal will be one actual computation, which is in a particular example, we're going to show an equivalence between asymptotic symmetries and soft theorems. And then hopefully that punchline will lead to these currents, which will look like we want to rearrange scattering in terms of what we're calling a celestial CFT. And then hopefully in the last day, we'll build together the elements of that dictionary. So that's the plan. And then this one doesn't, this one goes up? This isn't low. Okay, no worries. So let me, now that we have our plan, start with, I guess, the why we're here. So why are we here? Because it's fun to visit Warsaw or because we're interested in quantum gravity. And so every time one would give like a public talk or motivate what you're doing, it's somehow you're hearkening back to this like problem of trying to resolve having a theory that's consistent with both quantum mechanics and GR. Uh, and so depending on what subfield you're from, you might say that string theory answer this for you. And in particular, this is looking at trying to understand what would be consistent in the UV. Now, if you're Malasena and others building off of that for the last 25 years or so, uh, one thing that string theory is doing for you is it's giving you a concrete realization of this ADS-CFT correspondence. Telling you that our universe can be holographic in the special case of these uh, curved space times. But that's not the only place where you'd see holography. And if anything, uh, the holographic principle dates back earlier to studies of black hole thermodynamics and why it is that we see kind of this uh, entropy scaling like area in this gravitational setting as opposed to uh, with the volume of the system if it was a normal quantum field theory. And so basically, we believe that this holographic principle should be more general. And so celestial holography is all about trying to understand how to apply this in the flat limit. So for us, and maybe for those because there are younger students here, I want to say what the holographic principle is telling us is that we think that any uh, quantum theory of gravity can be encoded in a non-gravitational uh, theory in basically a QFT without gravity. And I mean quantum theory, so I'll actually be a conformal field theory at the boundary. And so basically, when celestial holography, we're going to try to take insights from this ADS-EFT story and apply it to the lambda equals zero case. I'm basically applying the holographic principle to lambda equals zero space time. And if you want to be dramatic, you can say, well, one definition of celestial holography is just like flat holography. Another one could be, say, look at the night sky. We say the universe is holographic. Where is everything that we talk about happening in our bulk encoded on the night sky? And we're going to basically return to that picture in various forms, um, whether it's via scattering amplitudes or, um, or this asymptotic analysis. And the whole point is that we can relate them all by uh, understanding this uh, asymptotic structure of asymptotically flat spacetimes. 
And so what I want to draw next is, I guess, the different ideas that are going to come in here and where the different lectures you're seeing are going to fit into that. So basically, one of the upshots of celestial holography isn't just the application, but I would say the, the theme of ideas coming out of the Strominger group that we're going to be focusing on, especially with the IR triangle, is that we can try to make headway at understanding flat holography starting from uh, the bottom up. So kind of this lesson from Strominger, uh, or I would say lesson maybe even from like people like doing ADS-CFT, like um, from a more geometrical point of view, like brown York stress tensor like, uh, and whatnot. Um, lesson we're going to try to follow is that we can make headway with ignoring what's happening at the UV for now and start with a bottom-up approach. And then one thing to keep in mind, depending on what schools you're coming from, um, is essentially you'll see in like the CFT lectures, part of like the principle of like the bootstrap program is you want to separate out what is the kinematics, which gives you the structure that's like basically like the three point functions have this unique form. There's like a limited number of different parameterizations of like the, the four point functions. And then you can impose different conditions that would let you try to solve for the data which is the part that's not fixed by the kinematics. And so part of the cool thing about celestial holography uh, is also part of the thing where people are like, well, you're just doing kinematics. But if you find more and more symmetries, then the idea is that there's more things that are just kinematics and then fewer things that are the dynamics. Um, and so I would say it's kind of a complementary approach to say a bootstrap program you would do after you know all the symmetries and you know how they organize things. And so that's one thing just to keep in mind for those who want to compare uh, what we're doing now to that. But let me also now say how the different lectures fit in. So we saw Yannick's first lecture, which was really nice because it wasn't just following like Bondi, Berg, Metzer, and Zacks, which is one crutch you can have if you just open up uh, Andy's lecture notes. So and he's going to teach us about the boundary of these space times with lambda equals 0 and their symmetries. And then my goal is to tell you about how those symmetries tell us about scattering, and in particular, tell us to map to the celestial CFT. Which, if I ever write CCFT, that's what I mean. But perhaps Laura and Yannick would say CCFT should be Corollian CFT. Just a shout out to them. And then Tomas is going to tell us about scattering and Piotr obviously about CFT and Tim Twisters. So, I mean, what I've written right now obviously is from the titles of their thing, but let me just try to explain. The point would be once you appreciate that there's these enhancements of symmetries coming from the structure of the boundary of space times with vanishing cosmological constant, and seeing that they are corresponding to very soft limits of scattering, um, if they are telling you basically that you want to go and uh, look at a boost basis instead of the normal translation basis, then you're really going to want to know how the S matrix is behaving in order to do those transforms that you need to do to change to that basis. So a thorough knowledge of various structures of the scattering matrix are going to be uh, important for just then automatically going through what this dictionary is going to be. So that's where Tomas is really helpful to have uh, as like a group of people, like his team, um, when we're building up the celestial stuff. And then once you really know what properties of the CFT, someone who knows CFT very well can, uh, can tell you what, what type of CFT you have. And there's various subtleties, especially because we're going to see it's almost like we're in one lower co-dimension um, in this story than you would normally have. And so it's a kind of exotic CFT. And so one fun thing about celestial CFTs is especially um, some of Yannick's other work uh, with Laura and uh, Romain are kind of treating CFTs on null surfaces. Uh, and so one should be a little bit careful about um, 
what assumptions went into writing 2D CFT correlation functions that look like this. Um, and it's al always fun when you have basically uh, something that um, you can look back at the bulk and see what you should expect. And it kind of makes you uh, realize that you're making assumptions that you thought were natural but might not be in a certain context. So I want to point that out. And then the cool thing about what Tim is going to tell us about is not only is it going to help you with certain aspects of understanding scattering, but also there's recent work, which is, I guess, a little bit further afield from the, the stuff you're going to see in his lectures, uh, where some examples of like top-down constructions of celestial CFTs are using twisted holography, um, which is a whole nother <laughs> whatever, but, but you want to learn about twister theory um, so in twister space. So that's way fun. So now that we have the big picture of how different people's lectures are going to fit into what I want to talk about today, let's also look at another big picture, which is of the entire space-time. And so you're going to hear, I think, tomorrow from Yannick about um, the uh, formal compactification of Minkowski space. But I want to just at least uh, contrast two things. which, again, depending on if you are coming from, say, an if-from-qubit perspective, or you're doing ADS-CFT, like uh, is popular these days, uh, you're going to be used to a very different um, kind of configuration. So if I was doing ADS-CFT, and I say I'm in the standard, I'm interested in um, basically the 40 physics, but I don't mind adding in a curvature scale as like some sort of IR cutoff, then I would have my ADS-4, in the bulk, and a CFT three in the boundary, where in particular the time direction uh, in the bulk and the boundary, I can understand the the notion of the gravitational charges being co-dimension two. It's clearly co-dimension one uh, on the boundary, and I basically am thinking about evolving um, both my bulk and boundary in this way. And so things get weird when you go null, when you go, I'm sorry, when you go flat, because when you go flat. The conformal boundary is going to have a very different structure. And I'm going to try not to um, like derive different features of this, but just basically highlight the things that are going to be different and why taking the flat limit isn't super obvious and basically to what extent like you need to treat flat holography somewhat on its own or at least understand assumptions being made in that limit. So I'm just going to draw some things for now, uh, but I feel like this is going to be treated um, more systematically probably by Yannick. Um, but let me just at least introduce notation because if I might uh, talk about it later. So rather than having this time like cylinder and a CFT3, I have now um, past null infinity where any sort of massless waves are going to come into my space time. And then basically this is r equals zero and they would come out at a 45. I have past time like infinity where any massive particle is going to do its thing and, and go out to future time like infinity. And then if I think of my Cauchy slice, and I want to go out to very, very large radii, what I'm going to do is if I was at a constant time slice, I would end up at spatial infinity. And a couple of things are going to be important to note, is that basically, if I go from this point over here, say the future limit of past null infinity, to the past limit of future null infinity, there's going to be an infinite amount of time. And so basically, things that might look like it's just one point on this conformal compactification, you need to be super careful about whether you actually expect the field configurations in the bulk to, to have any nice features in that. And so the last thing that I want to get to today is going to be just using an electromagnetic example, seeing that there's this antipodal matching of the electromagnetic field string across those points. And then Another thing I want to draw is that basically now this is suppressing an S2, except for I, the, this is just a point that R equals zero. Let me say this, this R is equal zero. And then over every other point, you're going to have a celestial sphere here on S2. And then just for maybe some notation I should add here, the time coordinate here is going to be U, where U is going to be T minus R. And similarly, if I was looking at uh, the story along past null infinity, I would have V is T plus R. And then I'm often going to use uh, stereographic coordinates, which is, say, Z 
is e to the i phi 10 theta over 2. And I believe you saw, I think it was at Tomaz's lecture, or one of them we were talking about um, stereographic coordinates of the sphere, too. So I've kind of drawn some coordinates on this thing. The first thing I wanted to just point out is that the boundary is going to be different. So if we took our statement of holography as saying we should have some theory living on the conformal boundary, then you can take it in different ways. So one thing is going to be important is you have to be more careful about what happens at i plus and my minus, uh, sorry, plus i minus and i zero. Um, and now you have the surface that's null. And the celestial CFT is basically dimensionally reducing you to the sky, like the, the sphere, and then like that's a cross section. Um, but it's totally legit to try to also think about correlation functions on the surface. And, and Yannick and Laura and the Romain uh, study those Corollian CFTs. One thing nice about celestial CFT is if you kind of have a picture where you're gluing all these different things together, it's kind of nicer to look at the S2 because um, I plus, for example, would normally be resolved with a hyperboloid and not um, with uh, the same like uh, R cross S2 type of behavior. So there is that. And then the only thing I also want to draw in some colored chalk is uh, if I take my time slices and I try to push them to either the past or future, I could define, say, an in-state. And similarly, let me get another color. I could define my out-state. And so the th point that I want to make here, again, okay, this doesn't move up, but it's OK, uh, is that based you want to move it right from the middle. Oh, I'm just, I'm weak. This is all I am. Oh. Name. I could the whole time I could have. Anyway, so now we know it's a strength issue and not a. I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah, good. So, so basically, the, the thing that I want to say is that um, flat is different but not scarily so. Indeed, if anything, the point would be that the, the ways in which it's different are actually quite fun. And that's the fun that we're having in a, in a workshop or a um, school about celestial holography. And so when I say it's not scarily different, it's that I still can think of my theory as kind of living on the boundary. But then you have to deal with issues such as like time evolution along this null coordinate or, or, or various other things there. And the other thing I can say is if I wanted to talk about um, correlation functions on this boundary, I can just as well view my in and out states for my scattering matrix in terms of correlation functions pushed to the conformal boundary. And so there's a sense in which if you have good intuition for ADS CFT, um, a lot of the formalisms like an extrapolate dictionary or whatnot will still apply in the flat limit. But then again, if you, if you take that very seriously, then maybe it's surprising if you think about how uh, when you see Nima give talks about his like amphithedron and all these like geometric features of, of the S matrix, it seems very, very different, even though that's naturally this like boundary correlator object, from how someone would try to bootstrap uh, a CFT correlation function. And so uh, I think that should give some sort of hint at the sense in which um, like, like no matter what, this is an interesting problem in some sense, because if you're thinking of it as just a scattering matrix, well, then you're studying like what you would be interested in if you were at the LHC. Uh, and these guys really are like, like for massless um, scattering amplitudes, you can think of them as correlation functions on these null boundaries. And so if you're interested in scattering, interested in that, you don't have to worry about, okay, well, the cosmological constant is technically non-zero in the wrong sign or whatever. Like, you know you're interested in that object from the point of view of like these particle physics experiments. And then you know that there's been a lot of mileage um, in trying to organize the data on the conformal boundary in this curved case uh, in terms of, say, the conformal bootstrap. And it looks very different than the cool things that Nima's doing, trying to unpack features of amplitudes. And so I think that gives one a lot of hope. If you want to apply holography to the flat limit, or you're interested in scattering, that the celestial holography program is a natural, interesting thing, whether or not you believe in it from the point of view of you're learning something from soft limits of scattering. And so I just want to make that point clear. OK. so. Let me put two bullet points along the lines of this picture, which will naturally fit into the slide above. 
which is, I guess, just flushing out what I was saying before. So I want to say first thing to write it out. So the causal structure of the boundary is different. And this leads to two routes, either of these Corollian CFTs, if you're looking at massless scattering, or it can lead you to this dimensional reduction, which is CCFT. And the other point is that this causal structure is also tied to the symmetry enhancements for asymptotically flat space times. And this is the starting point for the Strominger et al. program, which I'm going to get to in this and then the next lecture. But the other thing, this is so this is how it's different. This is the different. And then how it's not as scarily different is that again we can view, still view scattering. is boundary data, data, and prepare the uh, in and out states with operators at, uh, say, scry plus minus, or i plus minus, it's an error. So, so it's not too different. May I ask that yeah. Uh, do we still construct the dictionary in the flat case as some limit or strict limit or matching the sectors of supergravity? Uh, do we still view it as some limit of uh, uh, Stratolos to Cathy's in super strictly? Or do we look beyond that and try to find into us? So one thing to be careful about is I would say it's more like one should use constructions of like parts of ADS CFT that are perturbative in the in the bulk or where we have a lot of control. And then also where you're not really using the full string theoretic version because you don't want to take the flat limit and have other compact directions become large too. So you're 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 changing the number of uh, of uh, non compact dimensions. And so I would say, if anything, this is why it's cool that you have this twisted holography story and you're learning about the underlying like twister space, because these top-down constructions are not something you can just get from like limits of the top-down ones you have in the in the ADS story. But um, so so basically, some caveats for the way that people kind of we have a handle on this is we're often using kind of the the limit of the hologram where the bulk is perturbative. Um, but once you really are confident in the symmetry structure you expect, the hope would be that you can just like build intrinsically defined like boundary theories that have like the currents that you want to have, for example, and then, um, or you can try to find um, examples where you have something like a top-down construction and see how general they are, and see if you can go beyond these kind of very special theories, uh, uh, with like burns like weird um, Euclidean <laughs> space times with funny blown up points. Um, Basically, we move from the, we move past the symmetry in the sense that we have about symmetries. We, you're, you're like doing the, you can do the bottom up version of the flat limit of ADS CFT, I think is what I want to claim. I don't think that, like you can't just take um, all the full, like examples of ADS CFT, take a flat limit without ruining the fact that you're no longer staying then in, in, uh, in say like a 40 flat space time. So everything bottom up, I know how to do, I think, rough, or roughly weak is close. Mm. Any further questions? OK, so then let me just highlight again um, maybe two themes we're going to see. I guess I can use this slide here. And I'll make it in blue so that this is different. So basically, our themes. are going to be, first of all, 
we want an intrinsic description. Description at the boundary. But in many cases, especially when we can treat the bulk as perturbative, this intrinsic description is going to be inspired by um, kind of pulling back to the bulk. Bulk. So by which I mean, for example, if I tell you or we've studied how like the metric and the curvature and the gravitational radiation is behaving near this conformal boundary, and then I can really build like an extrapolate style dictionary, um, some objects that I would normally have on my boundary CFT, I can compute on the bulk side of the dictionary when it, again, in this limit where the bulk is perturbative. And I am building up basically, um, say, like which uh, two point functions I want in the Crowley in theory based on the fact that I know that those are, are bulk uh, operator correlation functions. So basically, one could imagine if you try to systematize what happens on the boundary and then there's some choices or ambiguity. You're guided by the fact that you know what's happening in the bulk and that you're, in this, you're trying to build up the limit of the duality where it's a perturbative bulk. And I think that happens a lot. And then the other thing that's just happening a lot is various changes of bases. And so again, the physics shouldn't change based on it. But if there is some scattering basis where certain features become natural, and the argument that we're going to make for the boost basis, which is kind of one maybe hardliner definition of the celestial hologram or celestial amplitudes, is that in that case, you're going to basically see the need or the possibility of organizing scattering in terms of way more symmetries. So there's an infinite number of angle-dependent symmetry enhancements that we're going to see uh, today and tomorrow. And then there's also a notion of a tower of kind of um, less and less soft um, behaviors that also have a universal um, like kind of algebra coming from the collinear limits that I think we'll get to uh, between three and four. And so, the, but the point to mention is that basically in a lot of these situations, you're looking at scattering from the point of view of position space versus looking at it in a standard momentum basis where you're like computing like say park taylor amplitudes or whatnot. Um, some things are easier and you shouldn't be making things harder for yourself unless there's a good payoff. Um, but it is nice to have the space-time picture because, for example, um, what I'm going to talk about next is IR triangle. And there it's basically like looking at the same equations or equations that look very similar in a literature where one, people, one set of people were studying um, memory effects, like basically like these tail behaviors of like how the gravitational radiation is going to affect um, some test masses as compared to um, how an amplitude behaves when you have another particle going soft. And so we're going to see both of these themes in what I talk about now. So let me then go to the second half of my outline for the day, which is going to be this IR triangle. And today it's going to be focusing on um, the, uh, basically, the, the, just the memory effects and uh, the setup for the IR triangle. OK. So I I'm actually facing the front. Okay, so the IR triangle is just a fun branding for a equivalence between various different concepts, which I will then try to flesh out in more detail. Memory effects, asymptotic symmetries, soft theorems. And so nominally, Yannick is going to tell you about asymptotic symmetries. Uh, Tomas is going to tell you about soft theorems. And so for due diligence, I need to tell you about memory effects. But nominally also, uh, these two being related are the things that all you really needed to push through the symmetry story. It's just nice that there are physical observables that you can find because that's where um, you can tell the experimentalist what to look for. So what I want to point out is just a pattern where, if anything, these are just changes of basis of each other. So basically, the difference between a soft theorem and a memory effect is going to be just changing from position to momentum space. So it's going to be a Fourier transform. 
up to some subtleties of whether you're computing the probability for a, like, or the amplitude that gives you the probability for in another soft emission as opposed to the expectation value of the same field in a given um, state. Asymptotic symmetries and memory effects are related by vacuum transitions. And one particular feature of asymptotically flat spacetimes, so by asymptotically flat I mean lambda equals zero, but now once you have matter, um, you're no longer exactly like the Minkowski spacetime metric, and that's going to be discussed in detail by Yannick. But in particular, the IR structure is such that um, we have various um, kind of vacua labeled by, say, super translations, and depending on how bold you are, you might say also like super rotations. Um, and the question of whether you can dynamically like have something that kind of moves you between two of ones uh, is a little bit subtle, um, like depending on the number of spacetime dimensions, or if you want to go to this like super rotations, do you really have, say, snapping cosmic strings? Um, but it's fun um, to basically see that essentially these they're physical observables and they're symplectically paired to uh, like parameters of of this. Um, of the, the frame that you're using at infinity. And so one other thing here, this is important, and this will be the topic of tomorrow's, is that asymptotic symmetries and soft theorems are basically how you realize the word identities for these asymptotic symmetries. And so what we're going to basically see is tomorrow the point will be to show that in the space-time perspective, we're looking at the phase space of um, basically gravitational scattering or electromagnetism uh, in terms of taking my Cauchy slice up to null infinity, the statement that there is this symmetry corresponding to these asymptotic symmetries, which are going to be um, what I'll hint at soon, is kind of an angle-dependent enhancement of what you think of as like global charge conservation or global like energy conservation. Um, those are the position space analog of what in momentum space is the relation between what the likelihood of scattering is with or without another um, gauge boson inserted. And so the point of this story isn't just that there's three things where I can change a basis or I can reinterpret it uh, and basically go between the two, but also that this pattern is universal. And so one thing nice about finding patterns is that you can fill in missing gaps. And so for example, the example I'm going to use because that way I don't need to talk about gravity because Yannick's going to, is leading e &M. I'll label it by the soft theorems. But there's also leading gravity and subleading gravity. And so the first iteration of this IR triangle was filled in, I guess, completed with Sasha's paper with Andy, where they related this memory effect in gravity to the leading soft theorem. And there they literally just found two papers where the equations look very similar, and they even screenshotted in Andy's lecture notes. And so basically, if you had a way to just reverse equation search and find like equations that look similar, you'd have found these two kind of unrelated, or at least maybe depending on who you are, like nominally unrelated uh, canons that you can connect via the similar mathematics of these equations. And then once you kind of go around that and understand why they're connected, you see this pattern. And in particular, so while the leading in, uh, in all these soft theorems were basically studied in like the the 1960s by Weinberg, these first two leading ones. The subleading one was until like 2014 or so that Cachazo and Strominger uh, showed that there should be a subleading soft graviton theorem. And they were looking for that because they were inspired by this connection and some proposals for super rotation symmetry here. So, and then based on that in 20, I guess 15, uh, we proposed a new memory effect. And so basically, um, there's power to seeing where there always is another uh, corner. If there's one that's missing, you can fill it in. Um, and so that's where new things can come out of old patterns, right? So that's a fun thing. Um, so basically, I want to emphasize that it's not just um, the point of like calling things what they are. The hope is that you can find new things uh, because there's something that was missing in the literature. And so in particular, there's a lot of other, like you can study gauge theories, you can try to generalize things too. Like what if it's just like some scalar or like some, some, some Susie stuff. Like uh, basically 
uh, if you understand exactly what's underlying these connections, there's other generalizations where you can go and try to maybe make predictions for experiments like at RIC, for example. So there's active things here. And the kind of cool thing about it too is that I think that people are actually in the gravitational waveform side of things studying um, like the BMS frame in a way that it helps them match uh, the analytic computations where you know like the bonding mass loss conservation should hold to numerics where you might um, kind of not want to spend a lot of time to, to study the full evolution of the spiraling binary system. So it's neat that basically phenomenologists also care about the, the BMS frame and there's like, but not. Okay, so what I want to then talk a little bit about is um, the basically the gravitational and then more the ENM example of what a memory effect is. And so I'm just going to draw some pictures, and then hopefully uh, you'll forgive me not actually doing the derivation, just kind of finding out the steps and then putting it to an exercise in Andy's lecture notes. Um, but say I'm sitting really far away from something happening, and I I'm going to want to move it down. Have my two test masses sitting a little bit far apart. They're going to move up in time, and at some point, pretty far away, there's an spiraling binary system. I'm going to draw this right. And in of its gravitational radiation. And so I'm going to not draw it at a 45. But imagine, say, now that's perturbed my detector, and they've moved a little bit. And then I can ask the question of how far apart do they end up as compared to how far apart they started. And so let's call this S mu. And basically, this is my time direction. Well, what one could do is one can study basically a geodesic deviation equation. And so I'm going to basically say, let my, in particular, let t lambda d by d lambda be d by du. So I'm going to change this from time to that. Tau is u. Then I have basically tau squared of this geodesic deviation between these two. Uh, freely falling test masses is related to some curvature contracted with these vectors. And so I'm going to plug in that trace of these time coordinates. And basically, for a very particular um, trace of body coordinates, things simplify. So let me write this out. And the thing that I've used here is roughly that in Bondi coordinates, I can like have a convenient parameterization for my metric. And so one thing nice about Yannick's lecture today is that he tried not to uh, lean into uh, having kind of already solved for like what coordinate choices you're using to uh, kind of pick a gauge that's convenient. But one thing nice about explicitly solving for it is you have some notion of what like the low energy degree to freedom on your radii of phase space kind of mean in terms of, say, this curvature tensor that's going to cause some test masses to deviate. And so in particular, in Bondi gauge, you can solve for the relevant curvature components for this very large uh, radius, like far away set of um, test masses. And you're going to see that the amount that they deviate is going to depend on um, what's going to be uh, the super rotation vacuum transition. So this is in particular um, for some sort of scalar mode C. And so I want to point out that these steps would be an exercise in Stromage Lecture Notes for those who want to, to follow it a little bit more detail about like you're integrating a couple of times, so maybe you could be careful. Um, so this is exercise in Stromage Lectures. But what I want to point out is the following oh, I'm so weak. fact is that basically the, the, the takeaway for us is that there exists non-trivial tails 
tail behavior of this gravitational waveform. And these are basically what underlies various IR divergence issues. Um, but the cool thing about it is we can measure them with asymptotic detectors. Detectors. And this is our memory effects. And that basically what we're going to see, I think, either in um, the soft theorem story of, of Tomas and then tomorrow explicitly, basically just the Fourier transform that's drawn there between the memory effects and soft theorems are telling me that a step function in U, so the shift in my position, turns into a pole in energy, just a soft pole. And finally, the fact that delta CZZ is negative 2 CZ squared delta C is this vacuum transition story. So in particular, the top corner and the various, the bottom right corner and then the explanation in the left corner, we are all seeing in this, this equation for the geodesic deviation. And this is going to be Taylor's lectures and Yannick's. So let me put this back in view. So the thing that I wanted to close with here is basically when it comes to a memory effect, it's a little bit, the one thing that's neat is that it's a type of observable you can imagine that's a little bit distinct from a calorimetric observable. So normally you would think at CERN you have basically these collisions happening, you have, you've accelerated these particles, they hit each other, then like they're going out in different directions. You have a bunch of layers that can try to detect different particles and magnetic fields to, to bend them so you can see which ones are charged. And you're basically just trying to stop them. Uh, and you can see like the energy deposited in different directions. But there are other observables which you can imagine which are not, like if you could really be sensitive, and again, there's gonna be some cutoff scale in like how sensitive you can be about measuring how things are displaced. But if I just told you all I care about is how far apart they end up being and not how long it takes for them to be there, you can imagine ramping down um, some of like the, the energy deposited uh, in whatever kind of wave is coming out to affect that. And so um, it's, it's kind of, it's not clear that it's quite the same as like just the Keller metric uh, IR cutoff of a detector. So you can imagine kind of building um, the types of detectors you'd want to measure very like low energy things might be something where, uh, say for this memory case, you have like two counter rotating beams and there's something that builds up over time. Um, and it's not trying to look for like how much energy was deposited because I want to see something that's nominally supposed to be very like a zero energy in principle observable. Again, there's still some cutoffs there, but it's, it's a different type of detector, which is fun. Um, and so now I want to, with my closing bit, just motivate for you one other thing, which is kind of take us back to electromagnetism, where I can avoid a lot of, uh, like we don't need to understand really null infinity. Uh, we don't need to understand the geodesic deviation equations. We can just stick to something that we know modulo plugging in, I guess, um, retarded in advanced times. And we're gonna basically be on the next step to seeing where uh, we're gonna derive the asymptotic symmetry ward identity story. So what I want to motivate in the final thing, and I'll just use this, this slide to do it. Also, I love the fact that you guys use chamois. Like also, if you go to uh, microfiber, it's amazing. So, so in the States, we just yeah, work so well. So let me just erase one board and close with the statement of antipodal matching. So if I stick to the plan, tomorrow I'll also be using the U1 example. So it won't be bad to at least have the action written down. So so I'm going to start with my action. And again, Tomas nicely pointed out we're using natural units, so I'm not even thinking about any H bars or Cs in here or permittivity constants. And I just have my 
f mu naught squared plus the matter term. And then I find my equations in motion by varying with respect to a nu. And I get Maxwell's equation. And so, in particular, say I'm interested in a superposition of a bunch of charges moving with different velocities, then I can write this matter source as taking the form uh, as follows. So this function of space-time. I have some sum over charges and of qk integral tau of uk nu where this four velocity is given by some relativistic prefactor and some vector here, like the ever seen. And so right, this picture is there's some constantly moving particle uh, where x mu k of tau is just this four velocity times tau. Okay. Now, Lienert and Vecker worked out both the gauge potential and the um, radial electromagnetic field. And so all you have to remember now is that basically FRT as a function of space and time has a falling form. And in particular, the point's going to be that there's an angle dependence coming from the fact that things are boosted. But from undergradian M, you might expect that you're familiar with this because you expect electromagnetic field lines to kind of pancake towards like wherever the, the particle's velocity is now moving normal to it. So you have now the work already being done in the 1800s of this form. So now all I want to do is basically take this guy and take R large, holding the appropriate quantities fixed. So to go to scry plus, I would want to take R to infinity, holding U equals T minus R fixed. Whereas to go to scry minus, I want to take R to infinity, holding um, V equals T plus R fixed. And when I do that, what I find is so basically, right, FRR is zero, so it, this turns into either FRU or FRV. And so I get FRU, that's gry plus, is E squared over 4 pi R squared, sum over K onto N of QK over gamma K squared, 1 minus X hat beta k okay, squared versus frv at square minus is the following. And so in particular, the thing that I want to point out is this difference in the sign here. And so in each of these cases, there's no explicit u dependence. It's just r dependence and an angle dependence. Same thing here. And so what you're seeing is if you look at that Penrose diagram, basically the two points on either side of spatial infinity are infinitely time-like separated. Because basically, I've moved from uh, essentially anything on scry plus is going to be infinite time. And then there's a question of like infinite future time, infinite past time. So you really are basically going through an infinite amount of time to go between those two things. But we're seeing that there's a very specific form where they're antipodally related. And note that if I had just tried to talk about the total electromagnetic charge, I would be taking this quantity, and I would be basically integrating it over this S2. But now it seems like, at least for this particular example of a bunch of uh, statically moving different velocity charges, I can essentially antipodally match the quantity at scry plus and scry minus. And so basically what's going to happen is that the starting point of 
uh, the next lecture is going to be trying to prove the soft theorem equals word identity picture for these asymptotic symmetries, which are basically now an angle dependent for motion of it. So actually, let me leave this right here. We're basically going to say we're going to take Q, which would normally be this integral over the S2 of star f, and we're going to promote it to Q lambda, which is now weighted um, by a function on the sphere. And we have a reason to think that we'll be able to match the, like at scry plus minus equals the value at scry minus plus. And then that equivalence is going to be the asymptotic symmetry, the fact that you act the same on the in and out state, it commutes with the S matrix, and we're going to prove it using the soft theorem. So that's going to be tomorrow's lecture. So basically what I want to just point out is that our takeaways is that basically boost or the non-trivial velocity is giving me a non-trivial angle dependence, which in particular we have seen in the denominators there with the boost factors. And then the next thing is that there seems to be this antipodal matching. And these are going to be key to what we do tomorrow, which is next time we're going to derive soft theorem equals word identity for U1. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, so basically, the way that we want to see it as um, like the charges for the in state and the out state, um, and so uh, for example, if you like, these will still be true for thinking about like what are my asymptotically uh, prepared in and out state separately, and then the there's also going to be contributions from the radiation when you accelerate, and so for example, um, the physical. Exactly, but, but that's a different component of the, the so that what's going to be there is as soon as I write the equations of motion down, there's basically the radial part of the electric field being related to the radiative part. And the radiative parts, like, so that, like then you're going to have an equation of motion where you just integrate both sides and you see that the difference in this guy, so the change, because right, there was some electrostatic configuration and it changed, is going to be related to the radiation and precisely because they have to be equal to satisfy something like Gauss's law, there's a soft part of the radiation that's just determined in terms of the asymptotic states. It's just like in previous lecture, I yeah. that uh, it doesn't matter how you parameterize your like, geodesic yeah. or, or line. So, so in principle, it can, like in uh, with the generation, but it shouldn't really matter. Yeah, so maybe one intuitive thing would be for the linear record guy, if I wanted to talk about radiation, the radiation is basically um, going to be proportional to the acceleration. Right, so it's like I radiate if I accelerate. And if I do the time integral of the acceleration, I get the change in velocity. And so basically, that intuitive picture would tell you that basically there's the zero mode of the radiation is related to the like final minus initial uh, electrostatic configurations of those asymptotically moving guys. And so if you imagine your scattering process is defined to be such that, well, I started with charges moving with these velocities, and I ended with charges moving with that velo those velocities, just that information is enough to tell you, well, then there must have been this like, uh, amount of radiation to be precisely what you're saying. It doesn't matter how it accelerated, it matters just the initial and final values of it. So that's exactly why there's a word identity. So, so basically, yeah, if, depending on the boundary conditions you use, you would have the integral over both contributions. But you could do, say you only had like retarded boundary conditions for your radiation. You would see that 
there's a the, the exact zero uh, energy integral of the radiation is constrained by an equation of motion similar to the way that Gauss's law would tell you like the amount of charge inside uh, to be the difference between the in and out guys or any other um, charges that have moved to null infinity. And so basically it's just like somehow like there's an equation of motion that's like du of f u r is uh, like some du of da az. I'll write it down tomorrow. Um, so yeah. Exactly. Um, so, I I think that I can learn something from either side of the construction more so than the full top down. So, um, like what I would be interested in personally is uh, when I see like Pedro talking about these continuous spin stories, um, like kind of the light cones of those particles all kind of collapse and go along null infinity when you go flat. And so to whatever extent they can do computations that would make sense in that limit, I think I could use them, their machinery. But that's again not using the top-down construction. That's really using the fact that ADS CFT is turned into a kind of industry of its own where it really doesn't like come from string theory. And so I can use that a lot, but I don't know how to use the top-down Unless I, I mean, I guess another fun thing would be to try to understand uh, like um, Wilson loop presentations of amplitudes that use an equals four, but that's not really, I don't think, coming from a holography point of view. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> 